morning good afternoon and good evening from wherever you are watching us from on the behalf of the nepal institute for international cooperation and engagement i welcome you all to the international to the international young scholars summit 2020 i extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished chair mr nishant fellow scholars and participants who have joined us through zoom and are watching us live on our youtube channel we are very glad to witness your presence here today the internet this international forum aims to bring through together young rigorous and erudite young scholars from all over the world over a single platform the aim is to create an academic space to encourage young scholars and academicians from the field of international relations diplomacy political science public <laughs> policy administration and related subjects the conference will be held for 3 days consecutively and will have 30 different sessions with two sessions running parallelly in white and green rooms the conference will feature 275 young scholars from 25 different countries delivering their presentation and sharing their understanding on various topics with us this session is live on our facebook on our youtube channel so please feel free to share it on your social media platform with a with an hashtag iyss 2020 this is the 20th session of our conference and to chair and moderate this session it's a real pleasure to welcome mr nishant with us mr nishant is an executive president nepal democracy foundation he is a core team member of office of millennium challenge nepal responsible for developing a compact jointly initiated by the government of nepal through ministry of finance and millennium challenge cooperation Mr Nishant is a regular contributor for the Kathmandu post so without any further ado i'd like to request mr nishant to chair this session over to you sir thank you nitin just a correction over there i think you took it perhaps for my uh, linkedin i sent my bio uh, one thing that you can check out is i'm no more with mcc but i'm still the executive president of nepal democracy foundation so to that extent i am right otherwise uh, i sent one uh, small bio of myself nevertheless uh, nevertheless uh, let me say uh, okay. good morning uh, good afternoon or good evening as it suits you and also let me say namaste namaskar sat sri akal assalam alaikum as you like to be greeted i'm jani shant uh, i'm from uh, kathmandu nepal and i think since this is a live platform at the time here at uh, my place is uh, four minutes past four o'clock. So it's uh, uh, really a pleasure to be chairing this uh, session. And uh, as the name suggests, uh, International Young Scholars Summit 2020, I can feel some excitement over there. And it must have been a great uh, learning opportunity for all the young scholars, especially those who are here to speak, I think, uh, Uh, would be enjoying this rare opportunity whereby you can practice the art of uh, public speaking if that has to be done under certain uh, specific uh, agenda so with that uh, uh, let me set a couple of uh, ground rules first my organizer has said that uh, i can't go beyond uh, 90 minutes maybe a few minutes here and there if they are kind enough and each speaker should be speaking for about 8 minutes if possible i will try to notify you when you have hit the 6 minutes uh, timeline so that you can wrap up uh, your presentation in the remaining 2 minutes uh, we are having about 8 speakers though all of them haven't joined but hopefully they will be joining us that means we'll be having our presentations in about 1 hour time and we have spared close to half an hour for question answer if any or even uh, i may have some questions for you so i do look forward uh, for this uh, great session and at the same time i extend a very special uh, thank you note to nn niice nepal institute for international cooperation and engagement more importantly dr pramod jashwal a good friend of mine for letting me have this opportunity to uh, chair this session three days uh, 30 sessions and 275 speakers well these numbers are mind boggling but uh, looks like you have carried out uh, this feat with uh, uh, quite a successful uh, event so congratulations to each and all of you who have been uh, instrumental in bringing this uh, session for the benefit of our of our young scholars so there is a slight reshuffle in the speaking order uh, instead of samir i would like to request uh, 
Mohammad Yashin. Uh, Mohammad Yashin is a PhD candidate at Jawaharlal Nehru University, India, and his topic of presentation is going to be China's diplomacy beyond the Great Firewall. So, if you are ready, Mohammad Yashin, I give you eight minutes, and your time starts now. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Chair Nishant and Nice Team. And today, my topic is China's diplomacy beyond the Great Firewall. So. As we know that Twitter is banned in China, but Chinese diplomats, uh, uh, which, yeah. So I hope it's visible, my PPT. The screen share is visible, right? Yeah, it's good, it's good. Yeah, yeah. So as we know that Twitter is banned in China, but Chinese diplomats abroad, uh, not traditionally known for being outspoken, have started to use the platform to confront Beijing's critics more directly and aggressively. Chinese diplomacy has found a new voice on Twitter, and it's not entirely diplomatic. Uh, first, uh, if we talk about the digital network, uh, widespread adoption of digital devices and social media have made contemporary society more global a network than ever before. Individuals are not only able to disseminate messages and interact with others in real time, but they can also participate in various forms of exchange because of the openness of organizations and institutions. Because of their flexibility and convenience, social media platforms such as Twitter have not only sped up organizational and institutional uh, communication, but also enhanced connectivity symmetrical interaction, dialogue, and engagement between organizations and the target audiences. The Chinese government has also enjoyed the communication dividends of social media, attempting to mobilize it in the diplomatic arena, analyzing the Twitter contents of two Chinese missions of the European, to the European Union and Canada, Huang and Arifon in 2018 in their paper, they find that the Chinese government has tried to use social media platforms to project the China dream or Chung Kuo Meng. So according to official reports, China's social media diplomacy is still in its infancy, although being a latecomer, but uh, right now in 2020, uh, the situation have altered greatly. Slight change uh, and then, so uh, now Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, diplomats and government officials are very proactive in their in their tweets and in their in their um, assertiveness. So Chinese diplomats. So if we see from the top, like when it started, so uh, the phrase uh, "tell China stories well," Chiang Hao Chung Guo Ku Shi, it was the phrase which was uh, which was uttered by President Xi Jinping in 2013, and it was an encouragement to use China's own communication channels to promote and testify to official Chinese views and opinions and to strengthen the international influence of China. And again, in 2017, President Xi mentioned that we will improve our capacity for engaging in international communication so as to tell China's stories well, present a true multidimensional and panoramic view of China and enhance our country's cultural soft power. So, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, they launched their Twitter account in 2020, 15 June. And at that time, Chinese official spokesperson Kang Shuang said, just like other countries, diplomatic posts and diplomats, our presence in social media platforms overseas like Twitter aims to do a better job in telling the story of China with its realities and policies to the world. Again, uh, so, this, uh, these two pictures just to show that how unconventional ways China are adapting in their storytelling skill. Uh, uh, as you see that stunning pictures of uh, Chinese ambassador to Kathmandu, Ho Yanchi, showcasing the beauty of Nepal. And she was also promoting the Nepal tourism, hashtag visit Nepal. And again, his counterpart in South Africa, he said that he also shared some nature and wildlife photos accompanied by quote by uh, Indian poet Ravindranath Tagore. 
And so this is just to show that how un unconventional ways uh, China are adapting in their, in their storytelling. So to be very quick, uh, I'm, I'll just quickly move to the findings. And then I'll see that uh, we, we can see that uh, media accounts, China media accounts, uh, joint Twitter, uh, like Global Times, CCTV, Central China Television, uh, China Daily, China Plus News, they all joined from April to November 2009, three years after the founding of Twitter. As we know that Twitter was founded at, in, in 2006, and in the same year that the platform was blocked in mainland China. This was also the year that the Chinese government under Hu Jintao reportedly spent 8.7 billion US dollar on a foreign media expansion project. From that moment on, Chinese media accounts slowly start joining Twitter. Around, uh, around the 2012 and 13 period, when President Xi Jinping introduces the idea of promoting China in the digital age by telling China stories well, accounts such as China News, Xinhua News, Huangming Daily, and CGTN all join Twitter. Again, region-specific accounts, including People's Daily Arabic, Xinhua Spanish, or CGTN Africa, all joined around this period. Around the year 2017, we see a small surge in Chinese media, government and city accounts joining Twitter. This is the year that China's belt and road propaganda machine is running at full speed. It is also uh, the year of the 19th National Congress when Chinese media focus on the message of supporting China's new era. But the most noteworthy first surge of Chinese official government related and diplomatic accounts takes place in 2019 at the time of Hong Kong protest. While mass demonstrations and violent clashes take place in Hong Kong, we see a total of 35 new official diplomatic government uh, accounts joining Twitter from July to November of 2019. And as we see that the most vocal uh, uh, Twitter from Chinese diplomatic uh, circle, uh, Li Chen Chao, Chao Li Chen, he's renewed push for diplomacy. As you see, and uh, that more Chinese ambassadors are on Twitter, follow them to know more about China. And then he also mentioned some uh, very vocal, uh, uh, vocal Chinese diplomats on Twitter. So this is how it was uh, pushed in 2019. The second rise of uh, the Chinese official accounts on Twitter takes place in the period of January to March 2020, when a total of 47 new official diplomatic government accounts joined the platform during the international COVID-19 crisis. And this is uh, the graph I have collected from Manually, I have did it from Twitter and also I took the help from Watson Weipo. That's very, uh, very informative news uh, outlet. So as you see that from 2014 to 2000, uh, 2020, we see the surge. And this is also uh, like some people alleged that uh, the Chinese diplomats were also uh, changing the narrative of their initial mishandle and mismanagement of uh, the outbreak of the virus. So uh, to conclude it, uh, Jonathan Hasid, the associate professor of uh, Loa University, he said on the ambassadorial tweets that often seen as an inappropriate to host countries, shaped the domestic narrative that Beijing was fighting back against global pressure. And this is also uh, very evident as we see that uh, Twitter is banned. So if anybody wants to use Twitter in China, he, she must be using VPN, virtual uh, private network, and then only uh, be able to use the Twitter. So this, this audience is very richer, better educated. You can also say foreign educated, English speaking, more urban than average. This is the group that Chinese Communist Party is keen to ensure that they stay very content about Chinese Communist Party. And finally, to run a truly global foreign policy, the ultimate challenge for China, is winning hearts and minds rather than showering RMMP or engaging in Twitter storm. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mohammed Yashin. That was pretty interesting. And all those photographs that you had of uh, the Chinese ambassador in Nepal uh, take us back to some of the newspapers and the magazines that carried uh, uh, that uh, those photographs with a uh, lot of uh, interesting titles. 
and apprentice is very popular in Nepal, sometimes uh, also for the wrong reasons, but otherwise mostly for the kind of uh, interventions he wants to make in Nepal's uh, domestic politics. And also uh, the kind of flamboyance that uh, Sage uh, having uh, for the general public. And uh, uh, in a way, she is trying to promote uh, Nepalese culture as well, as you could see all those photographs over there. Anyway, we'll come to those things just in a while. But uh, next we have uh, Mustaq Ahmad Rathir. He is an assistant professor, government degree college, uh, Gandharbal, India. And his theme of presentation today is change of the status of Ladakh as a union territory and its impact on India-China relations. So over to you, Mustaq Ahmad Rathir. You have eight minutes. And I will notify you if uh, you are not done uh, at about six minutes time. OK, so thank you. Thank you very much. So esteemed chair, Mr. Nishkan, and dear participants, a very good evening to all of you. My paper is titled as Change in the Status of Ladakh as Union Territory and its Impact on India-China Relations. I am not actually going to share my own video because uh, we have a 2G network here. Our bandwidth is very low. So sorry for that. You must be knowing about that thing. We have 2G uh, network over here. So let us begin. Both China and India were born with borders imposed under foreign imperial rule. So disputing these borders is far from surprising. Decades of negotiations between two countries have not resulted in any lasting solution to their competing claims over one lakh thirty five thousand square kilometers of territory along the border. The disputed Sino Indian border of some thirty five hundred or more precisely three thousand uh, four hundred eighty eight kilometers in Ladakh region witnessed violent clashes on June fifteen, two thousand twenty. The disputed Sino Indian border of some thirty five hundred kilometers in Ladakh region is now turning as a fierce battleground between India and China. Ladakh has, on the other side, largely remained peaceful when Jammu and Kashmir was grappling with insurgency. It has not seen any major conflict other than their demand for union territory because of certain reasons of neglect, etc. Although in culture, language, history, and Buddhism, Ladakh is close to Tibet, but Ladakhis see themselves as Indianists. I am sir, connected or not? Hello? 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 Uh, yes, sir, you are audible. Uh, you are audible. I am audible. Actually, we are having such issues here. So, we are audible now? Yeah. After 72 years, the status of Ladakh along with Jumeir and Kashmir was changed on 5th August 2019 with the abrogation of Article 370. And many analysts see it as the result of change in status of Ladakh has actually triggered the conflict in the Ladakh region. So far as the reaction of China is concerned, so it was expected that China will react sharply, though it did not immediately responded to the decision of Indian government as had been expected to do so soon enough because of two reasons. One, that it is close ally. Pakistan is deeply invested in Kashmir. Second, the parts of disputed Sino-Indian border in accession lie in Ladakh. However, China said India should avoid unilateral elections in Jammu and Kashmir because these could spark tensions in the region and described New Delhi's decision to recognize Ladakh as a union territory as unacceptable. Chinese Foreign Ministry issued separate statements on the issue of 5th August 2019. They urged India to be cautious in its words and deeds on the border issue, strictly abide by the relevant agreements reached between the two sides and avoid taking action that further complicate the border issue. It also said that they have always opposed inclusion of Chinese territory in Indian administrative jurisdiction in the western part of Sino-Indian border. One of the leading Chinese experts, Xu Shishang, he said 
one reason behind the new delhi decision to divide kashmir into two union territories was to separate two major disputes one with pakistan and another with china on the other side <clears throat> india's reaction was very cautious and meticulous the external the external affairs ministry spokesperson ravish kumar said that creating a union territory of ladakh is an internal matter concerning the territory of india and it does not comment on the internal affairs of other countries and similarly expects other countries to do likewise so far as ladakh is concerned for china ladakh is not limited to territorial dominance only they see it as an ex- unexplored region having plenty of natural resources which can be boost to their economy further its location also offers a strategic advantage in the himalayan region aksai chin which was part of ladakh before chinese annexation of it in 1962 connects xinjiang province of china so one should not be surprised that the activities of india near lac line of actual control in recent past like construction of roads and other infrastructure the reactivating of air fields by india in daulat beg oldi fakchi and nayoma to reduce reliance on leh the highest uh, in a way i uh, defense air route has caused a concern for china india's heavy investment on road construction in the region particularly dbo road construction allows it to reach aksai chin with ease it is a well known fact that aksai chin is crucial to china's access to central asian regions more so for it is china pak economic corridor which spans aksai chin gilgit baltistan balochistan so any change in the status quo in the himalayan region of the ladakh threatens the plausibility of belt and road initiative of china so because of that we have seen the skirmishes right from the april of 2020 and the skirmishes of june to 20 2020 mark a watershed in india china relations keeping in view the nature timing and general context within which these took place following a month long stand off in ladakh's galwan valley and pangong so culminated into violent clashes resulted into the death of 20 indian soldiers and unknown casualties on chinese side it is said by some analysts that recent standoff between china and india in ladakh region is actually after effect of change in the status of ladakh as ut union you have, only, you have only two minutes left now so according to china expert m tel travel mit professor the border tension between the india and china is going to increase to him the decision to make ladakh a union territory in august last year followed by modi government's claim to gain control over aksai chin had a strong impact on how beijing viewed india's resolve in the dispute and may have culminated in ladakh standoff so i am directly going to the impact on uh, india china relations so as we see that there is a breakdown in the context of recent standoffs we are seeing there is a breakdown of sino indian pacts economic retribution is on the cards and india has already banned many of the chinese apps firing is going at uh, lac after 45 years gunshots were heard lac is losing sanctity in a way superit of accommodation give and take have eva- evaporated to some extent going growing mistrust is getting forward to the military to military engagement china is emerging as a third key player in the kashmir conflict there is a heightened tension and war mongering on the both sides both are blaming each other for violating status quo both agree that resolutions can come through talks both knew each other's strengths and weaknesses china could become more vocal about kashmir matter between india and pakistan india can also rake up issues like chinese treatment of tibet hong kong taiwan and xinjiang as we all know that india has been mindful of chinese sen- sen- sensitivities so far and it has not raked up these issues in the international forums it can bargain on such uh, issues vis-a-vis china india can also work for militarization of cord in south china sea to contain 
the ambitions of china uh, with other uh, core countries china can continue india to its region by playing its small neighbors against it so in the last i would like to say that although it cannot be the comprehensive or it cannot be the totally uh, factor total factor in the recent uh, what we can say uh, bad relations between india and china but it is a immediate factor which has actually made them to stand off thank you thank you very much for patient listening thank you for that uh, very crisp presentation mustaq uh, i'm sure there would be a couple of questions later on for you as they come i will be posing that to you uh, next we have somebody who also is from nepal hari chan i guess uh, is it prasad or prakash hari chalo achhi baat hai bhaiya ho gaya okay harichand ji are you there hari ji are you there yes yes sir uh, yes sir good evening i am i am here i am listening okay i just wanted to check your availability so do you call yourself hari p chand is prakash or prashad hari prakash hari prakash chand Yes, okay sir. so next to have hari prakash chand he is a phd candidate department of international relations and diplomacy through university of nepal and his topic is bri and ips policy options for nepal something that is grinding nepal's diplomacy for some time now so it's going to be 8 minutes for you hari ji and at 6 minutes i will let you know oh okay thank you sir very much and uh, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, chair of the session and uh, i am speaking from the sukhe the midwestern part of nepal and here the internet is uh, so much disrupting and uh, time like time and again internet is not so in oil function <coughs> so uh, i'm i will try to uh, uh, to conclude my uh, uh, presentation within a uh, given time frame a uh, very good morning good afternoon and good evening uh, from nepal i am uh, hari prakashan pursuing phd in international relations and diplomacy from tribhuvan university of nepal and currently associated with the midwestern uh, university of nepal uh, uh, today i am here in the station to speak on bri and ips policy options for nepal uh, let me uh, begin my paper from the key issue of this paper the the uh, key issue is nepal delayed to take the right decision on a millennium challenge corporation mcc and also delayed to implement the belt and road initiatives the ri projects in nepal and uh, there are three research questions the first one is why bri and ips emerge and second one is how bri and ips implicate nepal's front policy and third one is what front policy options uh, nepal has in this uh, geopolitically changing world uh, the method i adopted uh, is qualitative research and uh, i have uh, collected the data from the authentic publications and website uh, moving on the belt and road initiative uh, it is the chinese president xi jinping's main foreign policy innovation uh, which was introduced in 2013 during uh, xi's visits to kazakhstan and indonesia uh, uh, the belt was announced in kazakhstan by xi jinping and the road was announced in uh, from indonesia in 2013 In total, the BRI connects almost 100 countries of the world. Uh, the BRI covers two thirds of the world's population, uh, whose estimated budget uh, is yet, almost eight trillion US dollar. The Belt and Road Initiative holds an attempt to rejuvenate the glorious Chinese history of cross-border trade, a network of connectivity, and interaction of civilization as claimed by the chinese government and chinese scholars or chinese think tanks and the chinese president xi jinping has a vision of globalized economic growth in general and developing economies of the world in particular based on the five pillars of the bri as uh, chinese researcher and chinese scholars have claimed uh, uh, moving on to the uh, indo pacific strategy the term indo pacific strategy was uh, used by uh, gorpit escurana 13 years ago in january 2007 uh, for the first time who was a marine strategist and executive director of the new delhi national marine foundation 
the term Indo-Pacific was used increasingly since 2011, and the concept of the Indo-Pacific uh, Economic Corridor as one of the foundation of IPAs was, uh, uh, was conceived during the U.S.-India strategic dialogue held in 2013. Uh, uh, similarly, it appeared first time officially in Australia Paint's white paper, uh, 2013, which is symbolically linked with the quadrilateral security dialogue. Uh, the US President Donald Trump first presented his vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, in uh, November 2017 at the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation APEC Summit in Hanoi. Uh, Indo-Pacific has also featured prominently in top-level U.S. strategy documents, uh, such as National Security Strategy uh, 2017, a Nuclear Posture Review 2018, and National Defense Strategy 2018. In 2019, the U.S. State Department published a document formalizing the concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific to be sustained among members of the Quad. In fact, the Indo-Pacific strategy is the expansion and revision of the Asia-Pacific rebalancing strategy, which was put forward by the, the then uh, American uh, President Barack Obama. And the purpose is to uh, continue China's rise and support US leadership in the region as per the claim and research of many global scholars at the time. Uh, you can uh, share your slide now. now. There are some Internet issues, now you can share your slide. Uh, sir, uh, because of technical problem, I, I could not share my slide and I will send, I have sent my slide to you, sir. And here, due to uh, technical error in my laptop, I could not share my slides. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, sir. And now I would like to uh, uh, enter into the implications in Nepal. What kind of implications of the RI and IPS is there in Nepal? Uh, the Nepal, being a neighbor of China and Na uh, India, has faced critical challenges in her foreign affairs in general and Nepal, China, and US affairs in particular due to the influence of the IPS and the BRI. Uh, Nepal uh, still is unable to pass the Millennium Challenge Corporation Compact from the Nepalese parliament due to internal political disputes among political actors Though Nepal has already signed with the MCC Compact on 14th September 2017, uh, the MCC is a part of IPS as, as the USA's authentic documents have uh, clearly mentioned. On the other hand, Nepal has not begun to implement uh, nine, major, nine major projects under the BRI uh, as agreed with China. Uh, some of major projects under BRI are uh, railway connectivity, uh, to cooperate uh, for development and prosperity under the framework of the trans Himalayan multidimensional connectivity uh, network, uh, protocol on the utilization of highways in Tibet autonomous region, construction of the Kosi, Gandaki, and Karnali economic corridor, uh, etc. Uh, the delay to pass the MCC compact and uh, implemented the BRI projects was. Riji, you have two minutes left. You have two minutes left. Oh, oh, okay, sir. I will I will uh, conclude within uh, two minutes. Uh, okay. The project because of the implements of IPS and uh, I mean uh, uh, why Nepal could not pass the MCC on time and why Nepal could not implement uh, the BRI project is only because of the serious implications of IPS and from IPS and BRI on Nepal's foreign policy. A policy options for Nepal uh, is Nepal's foreign policy basically based on the uh, UN Charter, Charter of the United Nations, non-alignment, principle of Pantrasil, international law, and the norms of world peace. Uh, if, if the provision of Nepal's foreign policy uh, we consider then uh, the existing foreign policy of Nepal does not allow Nepal to involve in any regional and global strategy alliance or partnership like in IPS, NATO, etc. Uh, if, if so, the following, following characteristics incorporated uh, with Nepal's foreign policy in the changing geopolitics. 
First one is Nepal's foreign policy should be real politic, pragmatic, and innovative, which has to solve the diplomatic hurdles. A uh, second one is if the foreign policy of Nepal formulated based on a pragmatic approach, centralizing the national interest at the core, it will be the theory building approach rather than theory testing approach. A uh, third one is it should address the key issues of major international stakeholders, maintaining harmonious relations among them. Uh, coming to the point of choice of Nepal's involvement in the BRI and IPS, Nepal cannot involve in the IPS because of uh, it is a strategic uh, partnership uh, uh, among the USA, Australia, Japan, uh, and India, and other new countries entered into the IPS. And fifth one is uh, from the above discussion, Nepal has to develop her own model of foreign policy, uh, which includes the uh, following four uh, primary and three secondary pillars of foreign policy. And uh, um, I would like to thank you to uh, Dr. Uh, Pramod Jaiswal sir for sharing my slide. And there is one picture in my slide. Please, uh, I request you to uh, display my that you know uh, that uh, uh, picture. Uh, there are four primary uh, pillars. Okay, of Nepal are you done, Harji? And uh, the secondary pillars of Nepal's foreign policy. Uh, Binita Burma, are you still there? Hello? Am I yeah. audible, sir? Am I heard? Are you still there, Binita Ji? I can see you, but uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Are no you audible? Are you ready with the presentation? Yes, sir. Okay, please go ahead. You have eight minutes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Chair, and uh, nice to see you and pleasure to have you in board. And uh, thank you to Pramod Jaiswal for inviting me here. My topic is the great power competition in the Arctic and the growing interest of China in the region. So uh, I'm introducing my sub themes here. The first one is the strategic uh, importance of Arctic in international relations. Second is history of China and Arctic relations. Third will be the what are the goals of the China in the Arctic, the strategic interest. And the fourth one will be the conclusion. So I'm starting um, here with the strategic importance of Arctic. What are the strategic important issues of Arctic Circle? First one is the climate change, uh, global warming, why it is in increasing, why there is a rise in temperature, and uh, which leads to the shrinking of ice sheets and then the potential release of methane, which increases the increase of global warming. And then there are the rise of sea level for which eventually change in global ocean in current pattern circulation. Second one is the new territorial claim for resources. Due to shrinking of ice sheets, new water bodies are emerging. And due to that, uh, surrounding countries of Arctic Ocean, and they have started claiming the region uh, water bodies of the harvest resources and exploiting the resources that are present there, especially the oil and natural gas. Third one is the new trade route. Due to all the above scenarios, there is a new facility because of the clear water, that is the shortening of trade routes. Sea access of water bodies is allowed in the international waters, but due to the territorial claim of countries are in emerging, then there will be no free access. Then melting Arctic ice has opened shipping routes, the northern passage routes and the northern sea routes. So uh, due to this shortened part, businesses will be profitable, there is no doubt, as the cost of transporting will be less. That is why there is so many strategic interests. So now one can easily uh, relate that how geographically or environmentally issue, uh, environment issues are, has turned up uh, into a geopolitical concern and economic concern. The fourth one will be the Arctic Circle countries do not have a permanent treaty to define their claims in the region. And uh, the, secondly, uh, the Arctic o uh, Council has eight Arctic uh, states, that is the Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Russia, Norway, Sweden, and the US. And uh, non-Arctic uh, uh, states are, there is 13. So in which, uh, uh, and out of which there is China, uh, which has um, uh, gained its uh, non-Arctic member state um, authority in 2013. Uh, a country like China might have political and strategic interest in finding a gap in the region so as to participate in the exploitation of Arctic resources. These type of condition admittedly have implications for the security environment and raise complex issues in the governing of the Arctic. 
so uh, the next is the um, history of china arctic relations from 1925 onward china signed the spitsbergen treaty which allowed significant commercial activities on svalbard also there is a country now uses the treaty as historical justification for its interest in the arctic for decades after signing it china was too weak to work there to act there and the early chinese media also discussed their foreign nuclear missiles over svalbard broaden in 1980s after around the uh, 60 years it um, suddenly emerges there and started their arctic mineral fishing and transportation potential there so uh, in 1925 to 1980 this was the period and then onwards the uh, 1990 onwards 1996 china joined the international arctic science committee <coughs> and uh, in uh, 1989 it uh, has launched a series of research vessels including the zilong which is a very efficient um, uh, vehicle uh, vessel there and um, 19 to uh, 1999 it happened 19 2004 china built the arctic yellow river station in 2010 chinese leader promote cautious arctic policy so as to not provoke negative responses from the arctic states at the same time china is trying to position itself not to be excluded from the access of the arctic so uh, these are the efforts which china has made and china appear, appears particularly wary of russia's arctic intentions there and uh, chinese observers have noted russia's decision to resume bomber flight um over the arctic and the plan and planning of a russian flag on the arctic seabed both in the august 2007 so and this all happened and in 2013 china became an observer state of the arctic council and 2014 chinese communist party uh, general secretary xi jinping declared that china should become a power great power hashtag so uh, so in many paper um it ha- also happened that china is strengthening its position there china is becoming more military active but uh, in my paper my one of the main argument is that china is stepping up its activities in the far north seeking economic opportunities there presented by the impacts of climate change but what are the strategic implication of its activities and could they take a military uh, dimension so basically china uh, now i'm coming towards the roles of the china in the arctic so the interest of the arctic uh, resources uh, china's basic interest is the arctic resources you don't uh, forget this between 88 to 95% of resources in the arctic fall within one of the five arctic ocean coastal states uh, eez and china is unlikely to challenge the provision within the law of the sea there and uh, china spends about as much as south korea on arctic research which is much more than the united states there so china is engaged in research on arctic geology geography hydrology meteorology sea ice biology and many of the geophysics uh, research um studies second is arctic research why zilong the chinese arctic ice taking research vehicle uh, which also called the snow dragon is very much efficient for arctic and it uh, developed extensively upgraded and developed in 2007 2013 as of 2018 zilong is the only chinese ice breaking research ship in the service you have 2 so, minutes yes sir yes sir. the polar on the polar silk road the arctic shipping route which is a very long term goal for china in the northern sea route Uh, which is by 2030 may be fully ice free earlier than the northwest passage or trans polar sea route shortening shipping distance from china to the netherlands by 23% so i'm coming towards environment and climate change these are its goal the chinese goal um, and developing tourism contributing to arctic governance peaceful and um, peace and stability in the region and now the chinese engagement with the arctic member countries are also increasing with canada uh, with us with iceland basically and with russia also um, but us is um, uh, just taken it very lightly that uh, uh, its enemies of us appearing to be stronger because the us did not add adequately and friends are weaker because the us cared very little about its allies friends and strategic partners there 
so strategic implications are there also um broader uh, there are broader strategic implications ensuring access uh, and there are two major goals basically ensuring access to commercial opportunities in the arctic and building capabilities to enforce the, its uh, perceived rights and claims in the region um there so i'm coming directly to the conclusion uh there is a large extent uh, that beijing stands is no different from the default foreign policy of other states that generally seek to safeguard their individual national interests uh before the pursuit of other national international matters and um, china is indeed an enthusiastic participant in the arctic but its role and presence in the region represents a new challenges and opportunities uh, same uh, in the same direction that uh, other or countries are also um, taking it a very competitive way that why china is coming to arctic region and uh, in lobbying for its arctic shipping agenda chinese state owned shipping company china ocean shipping company costco has sent vessels transmitting along the northern sea route and expressed its interest to increase its engagement in the region so while concluding the white paper has recently introduced by china in which a chinese arctic policy that guides its arctic discourse looking ahead china presents the arctic in ambition of polar silk road bring new opportunities and challenges for arctic as expressed in the chinese for good fortune follows upon challenges and challenges lurk within good fortune but um, a country like china might have political and strategic interest in finding a grip in the region so as to participate in the exploitation of arctic resources these type of condition admittedly have implication for the security and environment and raise complex issues in governing the arctic so um the white paper affirms china's commitment to upholding international law while promoting internationalization of arctic governance to extend to quasi arctic states as well as uh, stated in the paper china seeks to extend its belt and road initiative to the arctic as well thank you for the patience listening sir i will take a break thank you thank you thank you very much uh... Bidita, for that uh, comprehensive presentation, though your time was only of eight minutes, but uh, you could go to ten uh, minutes, but didn't make us feel uh, in any way stressed. So thank you for that. Uh, I don't know if uh, we have uh, other speakers uh, here present with us. Can anybody help me? I don't see any speakers that uh, are here in my list. Samir, are you there? No, uh, Simran, are you there? Uh, so I've been trying to reach out to each of them, but unfortunately, I'm unable to. Okay. So Harana, so I guess that okay. Even uh, she doesn't seem to be there. Uh, Marine Moe. Marine Moe. Okay, so I request uh, the organizers to keep uh, their eyes on the speakers who, though having enlisted uh, in my list of uh, being the speakers, they haven't turned up yet. If they come up, please do let me know. In the meantime, what I do is I go with the existing questions that are there aimed at uh, different uh, speakers. So, Mohammed Yasin, are you ready for some questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. There is a question uh, for you. It has come from uh, Nitin Sharma, and he asks: You talked about the Chinese dream and the use of non-conventional means to propagate it. How far you see the rise of the digital diplomacy as a means to propagate fake agendas? Given the losing hands of the U.S. from the internet and very fragile internet governance all over the world. Mm, well i i can see uh, thanks nitin for your question i can see two part of your question one is how uh, how is china's digital diplomacy and second one is like how this digital governments all over the world i'll try my best to uh, answer your question so uh, when i said that china dream uh, of course like as we know that uh, there is always a catch phrase with a new president coming to power so for the for this case for president xi jinping the catch phrase was Chung Kuo Bang, or China Dream, which describes a set of personal or national ethos and ideals in China. 
According to party, uh, parties, the Communist Party of China theoretical journal, Chiu Shi, the Chinese dream is about Chinese prosperity, collective effort, socialism, and national glory. And then uh, uh, the question is about digital diplomacy. So digital diplomacy, and to be very specific, the diplomacy, Twitter diplomacy, it's in the umbrella theme. It's under the umbrella theme of public diplomacy or nation branding. So again, uh, so if we see the digital diplomacy, China has been a laggard in this uh, public diplomacy or digital diplomacy uh, talk. So China uh, opened its uh, WeChat or Weibo, which is a Chinese equivalent of Twitter account only in 2019. And then uh, mm -hmm. of course, although China's some news articles started their uh, Twitter account in 2009 and then 13, but only in 2019 and 20, we see the big surge in uh, these accounts. So although China is doing great, but again, the, the, the China has been a laggard and China is also trying hard to cope up with the thing. And the second uh, part, I think uh, I didn't mention that to propagate fake agendas. I don't know about it, like the authenticity or fakeness, but like China has been trying to push its own narrative for both for domestic audience and also the international public. And the last part of your question, the digital governance, uh, of course, like uh, digital governance is a, is a framework for establishing accountability roles and decision-making authority for an organization's digital presence, which means its websites, mobile sites, social channels, uh, and other internet uh, and web enabled products, products and services. So if you see the objective of digital governance to reduce corruption in the government and to, to make it very fast track to ensure speedy administration of services and information. So that way, I think it, it, it's a global phenomena and China is also doing great in terms of digital uh, governance. And finally, just to end my answer that, uh, of course, this coronavirus dented China's image as, uh, as someone like uh, India's former foreign secretary Shibshankar Menon mentioned that uh, this is definitely a huge reputational loss for China. So again, we see the surge of uh, Twitter accounts from China, by Chinese diplomats and official, officials and to change the narrative and just to have a, a different kind of narrative for the domestic audience who are very tech savvy, rich, urban and English speaking audience who, can, who could use uh, Twitter beyond the great firewall. That's it. Good, very well taken. Uh, I have a question for you, uh, Dr. Mustaq. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Am I uh, audible, sir? Yeah, uh, the question for you is, uh, what do you think about the viability of one China policy? Since China does not value one India. And also, for instance, taking a hypothetical situation that code becomes redundant, what is the other viable option for India? Yes, sir. So far as the first part of the question is concerned, what do you think about the viability of one China policy? So I believe that China will not uh, like to give up this, although the uh, situations are not like that, that uh, the issue like Taiwan, Hong Kong or uh, Tibet, which China like to have under its fold or it wants to have all of China is under one single indivisible sovereign. But keeping in view the protesters or democratic, uh, in a way we cannot say transition, but uh, democratic processes which are going on in Hong Kong or in which is already there in Taiwan. So, and keeping in view the authoritarianism in China. And another thing, the support these uh, Hong Kong or Taiwan or Tibet, they are receiving from the other countries like America and more so we can say as I told in my presentation that even Ch India can also rake up such issues to bargain from India so that China can also realize that one India is, no, is not a what we can say uh, India's dream only it is India believes in that and India does not uh, want to give up its sovereignty on the territories which is, it is already holding. So 
viability we cannot say that whether it is viable or not but it is always dependent on the different forces when we talk about international politics so another thing which is about hypothetical situation that cord becomes redundant so this uh, as far as the cord is concerned and it is redundancy is concerned if we uh, accept that it is becoming redundant hypothetically what is the other viable options for india ahead to re configure the balance of power there is already it is not only cord apart from cord india is having good relations with america so from uh, manmohan singh regime and uh, more so in the present regime we have seen bone homey between india and america right from uh, we can say from 1991 itself india had been very tilted towards america and america is also uh, very uh, in a uh, what we explicit manner supporting india's cause so in order to counterbalance china it is not only cord it has even russia also there are issues between china and russia which can be also taken up so it is not that india will not have options to reconfigure and to create a balance so that is why as i uh, said in my presentation that there are number of issues where india can touch the sensitivities of china and more so india also like to come out of the region it is not which china does not want it to happen china wants it to contain itself in the region it can also in its neighborhood it can make its relations good with its neighbors which is a backdrop in the present uh, situation is india is uh, in a way not having good relations or it is not trying actually on those uh, lines to make it is uh, small neighbors uh, to give up that uh, what we can say big brother uh, in a way jo uh, psyche hai is there so that i mean to say that india needs to reassure it is small neighbors that it has the vision and it wants to restore the confidence and it wants to cooperate with its small neighbors so that it can counterbalance the and reconfigure the balance of power in the region uh, so mr park staying a little bit more on this one china policy or one india policy as yes. china hasn't given up its claim on arunachal pradesh as of now yes sir Do you think, uh, in near future or maybe also in a distant future uh, india might reconsider its position on tibet so actually from 1950 when actually uh, china uh, in, in a way get hold of this tibet india had right from there remained in a way silent on the issue it has not been vocally supporting that although dalai lama's uh, uh, in a way asylum give uh, was given to dalai lama was given asylum in india but uh, arunachal pradesh was also silent for some time there are uh, issues sometimes china has also changed the stand on arunachal pradesh earlier it was saying only tawang monastery or tawang district uh, there is a uh, what we can say conflict but less at times it has made it a bargaining point so india has to look on that so it has to negotiate in any way with china so giving up the claim on tibet is one thing there that can be a bargaining situation so let us see i cannot uh, see uh, presently as the uh, relations are going on and pressure the china is building on india however having said that china has global ambitions which america does not want india uh, this uh, china to it also wants it to uh, remain in the asia only for that america is only uh, uh, using india so it can counterbalance that threat so it is good for india presently i think so so it is not going to bargain or gamble for the tibet for arunachal pradesh i think status quo can be maintained thank you thank you for that dr mustaq uh, hari ji are you still there 
Harichand ji, are you there? Okay, by the yes, time- Yes, sir, I'm here. Yes, I'm here, sir. Okay. Hariji, you talked about BRI and IPS and yes, the past preferences with these uh, two policy issues. Yes, BRI sir. was signed uh, close to four years back without uh, much hesitation, whereas uh, MCC that is considered to be a part of IPS is going through a lot of debates in Nepal. Yes, sir. What do you think is the real reason behind why so quick with BRI and so much of hesitation with uh, IPS or MCC, let's say? Okay, sir. Thank you, sir, very much for this wonderful questions. Uh, based on my understanding, and uh, as I have studied uh, uh, Nepal's foreign policy and legacy of the Nepal foreign policy, the Nepal's foreign policy is uh, basically based on the uh, based on the mutual cooperation, based on the economic cooperation, uh, rather than involvement in any strategic or any security uh, alliances made in uh, in made at global or regional level. So uh, uh, while talking about the Indo-Pacific strategy, it is. Uh, uh, it is based on the uh, strategy cooperation or security cooperation to maintain the security in the uh, Indo-Pacific region. And uh, since Nepal is a small power or a small state and Nepal has not so many military power and also Nepal uh, has not uh, uh, exercised the military power in the history of Nepal uh, while dealing with uh, other countries. Uh, and Nepal has been uh, handling Nepal for affairs based on her diplomatic practices rather than uh, involving in uh, any uh, security organizations or uh, strategic alliances, and therefore uh, Nepal is Nepal. Looks like Hariji is uh, broken. Okay, we'll talk to Hariji as and when he comes back. Uh, Binita, are they Nepal involved? Hello? Yeah, we didn't hear you, Hariji. Are you back? Say something. Uh, uh, are you listening, sir? Yeah, please. Listening? Close your answer. Hello, hello? Yeah, please close your answer. Okay, Hariji, we'll talk to you just in a while, okay? By the time I hope uh, your internet will improve, uh, we'll get back to you. In the meantime, uh, Brit, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here, sir. Yes, okay, sir. no, Hariji, you take you take a break for a while. Your internet is breaking continuously. I will get back to you. Uh, okay, okay, sir. After some time, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, so Binita Barma, are you there? Binita Barma, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah, I have a question for you, and this question has again come from Nitin. And the question goes like this, how far do you see Russia's and China's interests clashing in the Arctic region? Though both are forming a bandwagon against the US as the Arctic forms a very important part of Russian foreign policy. But given the history of both during the Cold War era, what might be the prospect of bilateral relations in the future? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So basically, the how far do you see the Russia-China uh, interest clashing in the Arctic? The first part of the answer is the question, uh, Russia is a actually natural Arctic power in the region and uh, China has uh, a non-state uh, Arctic state. So uh, the northern country occupies almost the entire territory of the north of the Eurasian region and Scandinavian countries. All are the parts which are um, conquered by these eight countries. And uh, Russia and China have very... Um, subtle relations between uh, them uh, from uh, from cold war uh, time but uh, now but now onwards um, uh, russia believes that arctic is its privileged sphere of influence and russian authorities strongly assert the primacy of eight arctic countries in the region and uh, russia is not very keen on non arctic powers playing a dominant role in this part of the world as top of russia's version of arctic hierarchy there are five Arctic Ocean coastal countries, that is um, the European countries, uh, Denmark, which are Norway and Canada and the US. And it believes that this is aligned with the international maritime law. 
as the five countries have direct access to the arctic ocean and have ex exclusive economic zones and they are followed by the three permanent members of the arctic council and finland island and sweden so for russia the interest of other countries including the observer nations such as uh, such as france germany italy and the uk in europe and india japan south korea and even china in asia are at bottom of the russian hierarchy so this is where chinese uh, chinese view them very differently and dif differ there sharply uh, where china and russia clashing in the arctic issues and uh, whereas china wants to claim that arctic is a part of the global commons much like the antarctica and china is negating russian sovereignty over moscow's vast territorial waters in the arctic ocean which will become a prolific commercial hub in the near future in the future and in fact by claiming that arctic is a common future for the human race beijing is conceiving a new world order in which it will set the norms as a global superpower so as uh, as you can see in 2018 um uh, beijing disclosed its arctic ambitions which raised fears of the chinese takeover of the arctic and china identified itself as a near arctic state in its white paper so this is rather misleading given that china is a far away from arctic than poland but china has actually has a, a actual power as it stated as a historical stakeholder in the arctic as like it um, earlier said its south china sea dispute uh, it has a um, historical claims historical claims in territorial regions um and these all and uh, the white paper also uh, further added that countries should respect the right and freedom of the arctic states to carry out activities in the region according with the law uh, so china holds a very uh, specific um, views according to its white paper and legal um, documents it shows in the world and international arena and its implication are very sharp uh, as we say that russia china is our clashes in this particular uh, point and uh, what are the implications in future relations uh, in the, uh, between them so china holds the upper hand as in a hand in the relationship as this power seeking international order as symmetric will continue to grow to the expense of russia so but russia and china have more to gain from cooperation than outright competition they should uh, outright this outright this, uh, this competition, competition among this uh, cooperation this relation relation hello hello am i audible am i audible yes ma'am yes yeah. ma you are good go ahead go ahead so uh, bearing this relationship unlike course correction in russia's relationship with the west the partnership will strengthen against the us as uh, western countries spe uh, specifically us don't want to um, china to enter in the arctic uh, whereas canada and other countries other european countries like iceland canada supporting uh, internationally that uh, uh, mike pompeo has said us mike um, mike pompeo has already said on july 2020 that uh, it will not enter uh, the chinese expansion is policy in the arctic as it is it has shown already in the south china sea and uh, it will not give a full authority to china to enter uh, this region of the north pole so but um, in contrast to that um, uh, canada has um, fully supported uh, china in this region and russia also russia already supported china in this uh, scenario so russia and china have a, a strong um, hold in the arctic but as i earlier said that uh, russia and china are clashing in that uh, uh, interest of the of that region and uh, but uh, china is making a great um, support system in terms of research in terms of science and technology uh, with the, with the arctic countries and canada is supporting the china so china and russia may have a clash may, uh, in terms of uh, we can say uh, transport basically uh, resource um, in clashing in the resource uh, which is uh, arctic is full of resource and it may fit, but it should not uh, compete in this scenario whereas china having big support of european countries in the arctic stake, uh, stakeholders there uh so it should not clash with china as china is making a very big hold in the arctic
Thank okay, you. Staying, staying with you, Benita, for one more question. Uh, though the theme of this session is China, but let me ask you this question. Where do you see okay. India? When you see, where do you see India when we talk about uh, the Arctic uh, Ocean? Arctic. Yes, yes. India is actually uh, making a hub there uh, by 2000, uh, around 2012 onwards. Um, by uh, 2007 onwards, actually, we can say, um, Russia has already its uh, titanium flag there. So after that, uh, India has uh, 1993 onwards, it had making a research there, Himadri, it's a project there in, um, I think, uh, Netherlands or Norway, uh, sorry. So it has a project there and it's basically uh, doing it uh, geographically and scientific research there. Uh, it has a station there and uh, it is uh, basically doing uh, geography, scientific and uh, uh, very much of um, science and tech project. Thank good, you. good. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Mohammed Yashin, you are with us? Mohammed Yashin, are you there? Okay, I will come back to Mohammed Yashin. Uh, Dr. Mustaq, are you with us? Dr. Mustaq? Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Mustaq? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question for you. Let's yes. say if the situation in uh, Ladakh region gets worse and there is uh, a full military escalation, and if it goes, let's say, uh, really, really uh, at a very sad situation, and there are, let's say, exchange of uh, firearms and whatnot, uh, where do you see Pakistan? Uh, and uh, or how how you see Pakistan behaving? Let's say if the situation gets worse. So, uh, so far as I understand, Pakistan had always been interested to believe India and more so in JNK, which is, uh, which it has been contesting since long. So when situation gets uh, worst, as you said, it is also a hypothetical situation, but it can be as uh, Indian uh, defense chief has also said it, uh, it he has also in a way warned Pakistan to go for this misadventure. But keeping in view the situation of Pakistan, which is a very weak state, or some even call it a failed state. So I believe, to my understanding, it should not be puffed up by the investigation or it should not be encouraged by Chinese overtures to go for a misadventure because uh, India has already done a what we can say surgical strike at that time we have seen although there was collateral damage on the both sides some damage took place at air, air, airplanes where these jets were crashed but Pakistan as uh, economic position, its military strength vis-a-vis -vis India is very precarious. And it is domestic uh, situation is also precarious. So I don't think uh, uh, so far as uh, real politics is concerned, it will uh, try to have always a proxy type of gamble with India than to uh, go for a straight fight with India. Uh, even if China is uh, having involvement directly with the India. So it is my understanding. Even if there is a full-fledged war between yeah. India and yeah. China? I think so, sir. Because uh, after all, Pakistan has to survive. After war, there is sometimes the end of the war and it has to uh, wrestle with India. And uh, because of the, uh, and we have to understand that they have been the one political entity after 1947. And because of the partition, still there is a, what we can say, a psyche among both, uh, frankly saying, among Indians as well as among Pakistanis. There is uh, some, uh, we can say, which has not uh, yet gone. So 
I think Pakistan, for prudence, uh, as far as prudence is concerned, Pakistan not should go for this type of uh, misadventure. So uh, rest uh, depends upon the situations what Pakistani leaders think proper. Good, good. Thank you for that. Uh, Mohammed Yasin, I have a question for you, but before than that, let me check if Hariji has got back his audio. Hariji, are you there? Yes, yes, sir. I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening. Yeah, so uh, you had to complete your answer. Do you still want to say uh, something on that issue of BRI and IPS? Uh, why there is, let's say, such a quick, rapid action on BRI and uh, why so much of hesitation with IPS or, let's say, MCC? Uh, actually, sir, um, I would like to continue my answer of that question. And I was uh, talking about the uh, IPS and BRI. Uh, uh, first of all, I have to uh, uh, I have to talk about the Nepalese foreign policy or legacy of the Nepalese foreign policy. We never we never participated in any international uh, security organization or any uh, international uh, strategic alliance in the history. But uh, uh, we just uh, exercise our diplomacy, diplomatic uh, uh, diplomacy, and uh, we try to defend our national interest. Uh, by applying a diplomatic skills uh, from the part of Nepalese diplomats. So uh, being a small power and being a uh, weak military, military power, we cannot afford any uh, security uh, alliance or any military alliance. But, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but talking about the Belt and Road Initiative, since the BRI uh, is not any cooperation, is not any security cooperation, uh, Nepal has shined BRI easily, but, uh, uh, but due to being uh, the security uh, platform or security uh, alliance, uh, Nepal cannot or Nepal could not accept the, uh, uh, could not accept the uh, MCC or Millennium, Millennium Challenge Corporation compact under the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Good. Uh, if time permits, we'll uh, get back to you again. But in the meantime, let me go to Mohammed Yashin. Uh, you said, and also we know it, that uh, in China, uh, Twitter is banned, but the Chinese diplomats uh, use Twitter very frequently. Did you hear me? Yeah. Uh, please unmute yourself, Mohammed Yashin. I can hear you. So. Yeah. So let me repeat it one more time. As we know that in uh, China, Twitter is banned, but uh, the Chinese diplomats use Twitter very profusely. So it's a kind of uh, uh, moral crisis, let's say, or it can be an issue of uh, ethics or morality. I just want to ask you if you have uh, anything come to your knowledge, has there been any discussion, let's say, within uh, Chinese intellectuals or, uh, or any groups or even at individual level, that why if something is banned in China, why a few Chinese are using it outside? Uh, what is your take on that? Well, this is a very interesting question, sir. Thanks for your question. Uh, okay, well, so uh, as we know that Twitter is banned and again, we need to have VPN to be able to use Twitter. But again, uh, through Twitter, the messaging, the international messaging is not for specifically domestic publics. So it's, it's aimed at uh, the foreign nationals and the other uh, publics. And for domestic issue, for domestic audiences, they have their WeChat, Weipo, and, uh, and all, these, all these outlets, uh, even the, the state controlled uh, news media. So uh, again, uh, there was one report which says that uh, the, uh, I think out of the whole population, only one to two percent people hardly use Twitter. And again, there are some checks on Twitter, like if someone crossed or like some, some tweets are going against the party ideology or very critical about the Communist Party of China, they might be blocked or somehow like reprimanded. So that is number one. Number two, the Twitter account, mostly these news article outlets and uh, of course, the officials, uh, both government and diplomatic, so their uh, target audiences is not the domestic audiences. So that way, and the first part of your question, again, this is a question of morality, but again, morality is something which is like, we, we decide, it, it's not ethic. Ethic is something 
which is like our uh, social system offers us and provide us with something but moral is very own thing so that's again it, it's a question uh, it, it's a uh, like the more question of morality is it's 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 a little uh, interesting and let, second let them decide it <laughs> that's what yeah, you want yeah. to say yes yeah and and for again the twitter thing so again chinese are very new and even they hired some experts to use how to how to use twitter how to retweet and how can it surface more and reach to more people they have hired people and then they got trained but again this is the again morality question for twitter because it's banned in china and again the twitter people like people who are working for twitter they are helping those people uh, to 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 reach uh, further so that is one and again some people right now some people are saying that is china's uh, diplomacy boomerangish but again uh, this is i think it's too early to say that although chinese people are also feeling the heat from again like twitter is something which is very world like situation which is very instant and then if i tweet something i have to also be able to answer or uh, respond to those people so i think china is uh, trying to accommodate twitter all the social media which is also beneficial for its you know, public diplomacy and uh, for the morality question again this is a good question and uh, i think it should be asked to uh, very china good china experts or officials okay let me let me ask you one more question uh, now we know that there is a more restrictive law in place in hong kong uh, do you have any comparative uh, status how was the social media behaving let's say before the new law came into force and what is the situation like there on ground Uh, these days in hong kong uh it's it's not only really in hong kong even i would like to compare it with india like india we say that we are the largest democracy but again like some uh, some uh, some uh, encrypted chats a uh, chat box are also public by the news media i think if you follow the recent episode the sushant singh rajput suicide case and then the cbi the agency indian agency and the person who is their portal so their chat box is being leaked to the media and uh, and again like the hong kong issue so this hong kong movement based on telegram they didn't use whatsapp or other facebook messenger they they mainly use telegram which is also getting uh, quite popular here in india also so and again like uh, china came up with this uh, new new security law national security law for hong kong which is actually uh, uh, curtail the freedom and um, the political the vibe like political debate and also political movements and protest in hong kong good uh, thank you we are coming uh, very close to the final final moments of this session anybody if you have to say anything binita if you have to say anything or hari ji if you have to say anything in, in the end or uh, dr mustaq if you have anything else to add i can give you 2 minutes each if not then i will go for the closing remark okay the silence says nobody has to say anything thank you very much thank, thank you, you very much thank you sir uh, okay we were supposed to be having eight speakers but we managed to have only four speakers but still we could manage to have allotted one and a half hour time uh, that we have utilized uh, hopefully uh, in a useful manner uh, for our organizers so thank you all uh, one more time where uh, it is also a personal learning opportunity for me and since uh, these days no discussion is complete without discussing about china be that uh, a geopolitical uh, discussion or be that let's say any international business proposition or anything like that be it uh, internet or anything like that uh, the china has to come or has to feature in every kind of discussion in any part of the world and that's why i think this topic or this theme or this uh, uh, subject of china is so heavily dominating this uh, discourse of uh, young scholars uh, summit so thank you one more time the organizers for letting me have a few words from my side all the speakers for having those wonderful speeches and uh, i wish you all a great learning opportunity in coming days and hopefully we cross our paths one more time
So thank you and over to you, Paki. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Well, over to you, Nitin. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, thank you. Uh, please proceed with the word of thanks. Uh, thank, thank you very much, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Distinguished speakers, chairs, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to an end of our 20th session. And it is my honor to propose a vote of thanks on the behalf of NICE. To all who have graced us with their presence and contributed their part to make this a this event a resounding success. For first of all, we would like to express our profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to Mr. to Mr. Nishan for agreeing to chair this session. Our sincere thanks also goes to our speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such a comprehensive and convincing presentation. We are really honored to have all the speakers here with us today. We would like. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for our audience who have participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live on our YouTube channel. Thank you all for your valuable time and attention and for making session a productive one with your questions. We are truly honored to have you all with us here today and hope to stay connected with you in the future as well. It's really been a pleasure. Also do join us at our next session. Thank you all.